And Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem because they needed to pay their taxes. And when they arrived, it was time for a baby to be born. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and she placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And as always, every time an angel shows up, fear seems to reign. And the angel said, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all people. Not a gift for some, but a gift for all. He said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, just like this great heavenly host appeared next to me, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that's happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had to say. But Mary, she treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all things they had heard and seen, which had been just as they were told. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and so was Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where Christ was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem, Judea, and they applied, For this is what the prophet had said. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler, and he will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared and had sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, Go, make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so I too may go and worship him. Liar, liar, pants on fire. That is not what Herod wanted. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and they followed the star again they had seen in the east, and it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And they opened up their treasures and presented, did you get that? They opened up their treasures. And out of their treasure, they gave gifts. What were the gifts? Gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. Singing today because she was interacting with her two daughters right here on the front row. And what was obvious to me is she has been rehearsing this at home in the presence of her girls. Because the girls were in rhythm up here, all right, to the song and uh, mouthing some of the words. So that was great fun to, to watch. Uh, they couldn't have picked a better theme for their musical this year than the subject of joy. It is what uh, we have been preaching about since the spring. Joy and laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. And uh, the journey of joy ends in a very good place for us. And the journey that is not filled with joy usually doesn't end in a very good place. It was a few years ago I came across a very thought-provoking uh, statement made by Max Licato. If you've ever read Max Licato, he has a tendency to give you many thought-provoking words. And this is a statement that he made. 
He said, people on a plane and people in the pew have a lot in common. All of us are on a journey. When we get on a plane, there's a destination that we are traveling to. When we sit in a pew, there's a journey that we're taking. Many of us have ridden on planes before. And we have seen the difference of the way in which people ride on a plane. And we've seen the different attitudes of people who sit in a pew. Most who share both experiences are uh, rather predictable in what they expect. We like to say at the end of a flight, oh, wasn't that a nice ride? We like to say at the end of a church service, oh, wasn't that sweet? We often exit the same way that we enter. And frequently, we're pleased to return another time. But there are a few folks who ride planes and sit in pews that are not content with just nice. They long for more. Like a boy on a plane that I was riding a few years ago, when he entered through the door of the plane, and of course you go right by the pilot's cabin, and this little boy, as he walked in, said, do you think they'll let me meet the pilot? The pilot heard this through the open door, and he invited the young man into the cockpit's world of controls and gauges and gadgets. Just a few minutes later, that little boy emerged from that cockpit with his eyes wide and he explained to all who were willing to listen, wow, I'm so glad I got on this plane. No one else's face showed that same wonder. There were a couple of middle-aged women I noticed walking down the aisle carrying their beach bags on their way to Cabo, exuberant, and they giggled as they walked. There was a fellow in first class wearing a blue suit. He was cranky. Most of the folks, though, on the plane were simply content to be present, to sit and stare and say very little, actually hoping that the person next to them wouldn't say a word. Oh my, how flights and worship services are very similar. But not the boy. <laughs> the boy wanted to see the pilot. He wasn't going to be satisfied with just nice. That little boy was going to show the plastic wings the pilot gave him and say, Hey, I got to see the man up front. Enter a church sanctuary and look at the faces. Don't do that right now. It would be obvious. <laughs> but someday, enter a sanctuary and watch the people. A few are giggly. There's always a couple who are cranky. But by and large, most of us are content to come and be present. To sit, look straight ahead, hope the person next to me or behind me doesn't say much to me. Oh, oh, by the way, those who were cranky, it's because somebody was sitting in their pew <laughs> that they don't own. <laughs> and they all leave when the service is over. There are a few, however, and I hope the number grows, but there's a few every week who want more. Their heart is hungry. Their soul is thirsty. They want to meet the pilot. They want to find the one who sits at the controls. They want to know where they're headed. They want to sense the comforter. Because their heart's been broken. They want to find the savior. Because their sins have grown heavy with burdens. And they show up here with this childlike enthusiasm of the boy on that plane. I don't, well I should say I don't like pointing people out, but I guess I do, because I do it often. 
but I don't do it with any intent to create jealousy with somebody else. Sometimes, this, this is not in my notes, so it's always dangerous when I chase a rabbit. Some people say I'm partial, and I probably am. But I love to watch Corey worship. She didn't know I was watching her today. I'm glad you were up front instead of out back today. There's an exuberance when she comes to worship that it's as if nobody else is around. It's her and the Lord. She comes thirsty. So my question is for you, why'd you show up today? Many songs that we sing at Christmas are reminders that Christmas time is supposed to be a happy season. Uh, the songs like, it's the most, yeah, have a holly jolly Christmas, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, jingle bells, walking in a winter wonderland. All of these songs communicate that Christmas time is to be a joyous, trouble-free season. But let me ask you honestly, is that your experience? Is that your experience this season? This year? Maybe not. For some of you, personal issues are keeping you from experiencing the joy of the season. For others, you feel like one crisis after another just keeps steamrolling over you. And with such an avalanche of problems, it's hard to have a holly jolly Christmas. Uh, I can highlight just a few examples from our own sphere of influence here at New Hope. Uh, I mean, how about Pam Jarvis? Could it be a holly jolly Christmas this year after five knee surgeries in less than a year, all on one knee, and it still doesn't work? How about my neighbor sitting right here on the front row? Battling a brain tumor. They just, they just celebrated their anniversary last week. <laughs> Go, man. They went to Ruth Chris, all right? <laughs> I got another neighbor right across the street. It's the first Christmas without, without her dad. Funch family. Just yesterday, we did our best to honor Vicki. She was 59. She lost her battle to cancer. And to add trauma to turmoil, her dad died two days before her memorial service. But Steve Smith, honey, I promise after today, you're going to stop being an example in any of my sermons. But I am so proud of you. This Christmas is a first for those two unlike any they've had in decades. I thought of both of you as I listened to the song the choir sang today, Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. I think of my own wife. For years, Christmas for her had always been the reminder of Christ's birth and all that it represents. But a few years after she opened the last Christmas gift of our family gathering, the call came that her mom had just stepped from time on earth to heaven and eternity. It just hit me this morning, this is the 10th Christmas without my mom. Oh, how my mom loved Christmas. I wore the red sweater just because of that. <laughs> Mama loved red. She'd come down the aisle Christmas time and she'd say, here comes Mama wearing a red dress. You see, sometimes we are so busy with stuff and frustrations, and sometimes we're working so hard that there just is no time for sitting around a fire roasting chestnuts. Actually, this year, Shelly and I have given up chestnuts for donuts. <laughs> and maybe there's not anything really wrong, but for some reason, you're just not enjoying Christmas. It's, it's not providing that emotional lift that you expected. In fact, maybe it's almost depressing this year. The world does not look like a winter wonderland. It just looks like a bleak, cold, dreary winter day. Disillusionment at Christmas is not an unusual thing. I mean, think about Mary and Joseph. They were paying taxes. 
and they couldn't even find a room in a hotel to stay. We're so hyped with expectations about what Christmas is supposed to be from watching too many Hallmark Christmas movies to be that often the real thing just doesn't measure up and we're disappointed. Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem to pay those taxes and no place to stay. Giving birth to their first unexpected baby might have lost some of its excitement and thrill. So what can we do to avoid disillusionment at Christmas? I would suggest to you the answers I hope we discover today is not just how do we overcome disillusionment at Christmas, but how do we overcome disillusionment with life? How can our level of joy improve? I think the answer is found in the story of Magi in Matthew chapter 2. Magi are the wise men from the east and they saw a star that indicated the birth of a new king in Israel. And they wanted to honor him with their gifts and so they set out on a journey. You're on a journey today. I don't know if you intended to end up at New Hope today or it just happened. But you're a journey following something They followed a star to find a newborn king. Whether you're on a plane, in a pew, or between the humps of a camel, all of us are on a journey. From the attitudes of these wise men and the events that surrounded the journey, we might discover how to raise our level of joy this Christmas. Uh, Three lessons from the story. Number one, what do you seek? What do you seek? Maybe a better way to say it is, who are you seeking? You see, I believe that our level of joy at Christmas or really at any time in life is directly related to what we're looking for. Ask the question, what is it I want out of Christmas? What is it that would make our Christmas wonderful and satisfying? Is it snow? Then move to Montana. (laughs) Is it having all of your family together and happy and getting along? (laughs) Good luck with that one. (laughs) Is Is it a feeling that you define as a holiday spirit? Is it finding just the right present to give? Is it getting the present you've been hoping for? You see, the problem with all of these things is every one of them, and certainly a collection of all of them, can leave us disappointed. You ever had that kind of experience at Christmas? When you were disappointed Because it didn't deliver what you thought it would. May I suggest to you that the problem is not with Christmas. It is with where we are looking to have our expectations met. The Magi show us how to increase our level of joy by looking for the right one. What was it they were looking for? Verse 2 tells us, they came to Jerusalem and said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and it's invited us to come and worship him. They were looking for Jesus because a star invited them. What star did you follow here today? What star invited you? Or, or, Or maybe another key question for you regular New Hopians is to whom were you a star? Who who followed you because of your invitation? You see, a star was used to capture the attention of stargazers. And he'll use you to be somebody's star, to capture the attention of somebody in your world, a friend or a family member. And you could lead them to the one who is the Lord and Savior. Guys, you need to understand there is not a special requirement to be a star. Look at some of the crazy ways that God has spoken to people in the Bible. How did he capture Moses' attention when he was on the backside of the desert? Remember? He spoke to him from a burning bush. Pretty unusual. He talked to another prophet of God who wouldn't listen to anybody else through a donkey. I know. There are some of you who say, Tim, we come every week to listen to one. <laughs> God, God, God spoke through lightning and thunder. He spoke by example through a, a shading plant to Jonah. He used an object lesson to speak to Israel 
when he asked Hosea to go marry a hooker. If you're not familiar with the story, come back another day and I'll tell it to you. But it's a most, it, it, it was a story of God's unconditional love. Just as Hosea could love a hooker, God could love Israel. And God loves you. Think of the children of Israel going from Egypt to the promised land. A cloud led them during the day, just as a star led the wise men. A cloud led Israel. And that cloud, so they could see it at night, became a pillar of fire. Can you imagine waking up at 2 a.m.? Let's just say you're a man. It's 2 o'clock and you need to use the bathroom. It's dark in the desert. And you open up the flap of your tent to step out and you realize, whoa! Look at that thing, man. I don't need a flashlight. But more importantly, you look and you say, wow, God, in the middle of a desert, in the middle of the night, you haven't left me. You're still here. God doesn't have official channels for speaking that he limits himself to. God uses music for some, a twist of a word or a phrase for others, the loss of a job or the acquisition of a job to get somebody else's attention, the birth of a child. Illness and sickness. Some of you might be ready for this one. He even uses old age to get our attention. The wise men were looking for Jesus because of a star. That's what we need to be looking for and expecting this Christmas. An experience of worship. A fresh glimpse of him who was born king of the Jews. If our goal this Christmas is to worship Jesus, then I doubt very seriously that you will be dissatisfied with the experience. So what are you looking for? Number two, where are you looking? I certainly discovered this week, Macy's ain't the place to look. <laughs> she ain't the old store she used to be anymore. I hope none of you work at Macy's right now, all right? But where do you look? You see, our level of joy at Christmas is directly related to not only to whom we are looking for, but where we're looking. We learned from the Magi that there are wrong and right places to look for Christmas. They followed that GPS in the, squat, in the sky and, and, and they followed it a long ways and then all of a sudden they resorted to human logic and human reasoning. They got close to Jerusalem and said, hey, we're looking for the king of the Jews. We ought to go to Herod's palace. And they stopped following the star and they went into the city of Jerusalem and they began to look for him. They thought the king would be born in the palace of Herod the Great or in the capital city of Jerusalem. And what a mistake they made when Herod heard of the birth. He jealously sought to destroy him. You and I are tempted to look for joy at Christmas in the wrong places. We often think that by getting or giving the right gift that we will be satisfied. If we get the right attention from the right people, we'll be happy. We imagine that being with family will be joy-filled. All of these can easily disappoint us. You may not be able to afford the right gift for a loved one. Family members might be missing from your celebration. And if you're looking to these things for joy, you might be left with disillusionment. I, I got to confess. Earlier this month, I got caught up in that. This year... Plans didn't work out the way I'd imagined in my mind, and I sulked a little. And then I remembered. I remembered wise men following a star. And I remembered that Christmas is not about me. It is first about Christ, and then it's about others. And when I remember that, I become a me who is more than satisfied. You see, even pastors need to confess. The Magi looked in the right place when they looked to God. When they took their eyes off of Herod and Jerusalem and they looked up again at the star, they got back on the right track. But the trip to Jerusalem was not a total loss. While there, they discovered where they should have looked in the first place. The Bible. The scribes in Jerusalem said that according to the prophet Micah, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. With this new information, they looked again at the star, and the star led them right to Bethlehem, and it stood over the house where Christ lived. But God uses all things 
for his good. Jerusalem has now been put on notice. The Messiah has been born. Wise men, get this. I don't know if you've ever seen this in the Christmas story before. Wise men traveled anywhere from 600 to 1,000 miles to find Jesus. But the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees who lived in Jerusalem who knew the prophecies of Micah, who shared those prophecies with the wise men, they lived about the distance that Clovis is from Malaga. About six or seven miles. Wise men will move heaven and earth to find a savior. Selfish people won't go out of their way six miles to find what they need. Last thing. What do we give? What are we looking for? Where are we looking? And what do we give once we find it? Our level of joy at Christmas is directly related to what we're willing to share. The Magi came to Jesus' house bearing gifts. And their gifts were perfect. The Magi gave gold. That is a perfect gift for a king. And by giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus was and is the king of kings. They gave frankincense. What a perfect gift for a priest. This was the incense the priest used in the temple. And by giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus was a priest. The one who would bring us to God. And they gave myrrh. A perfect gift for the dead. You're saying, Tim, are you nuts? He's a baby. And they're bringing dead people gifts? Yeah. Because what was the purpose of his birth? To die for the sins of the world. This was a fragrant ointment used to anoint a body before burial. By giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus had come to die for their very sins. You and I should give appropriate gifts this Christmas as well. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about material gifts. I'm talking about something far more important. We ought to give the gift of love and kindness, and consideration to our Savior, to our family, to our friends. Here's a caveat for you. If you are thinking right now when you hear that statement, boy, I hope my family and friends show me love, kindness, and consideration, you have missed the point. That's not the thought we want from others towards us. It is the thought we should be having about them. We ought to give the gift of our help to those who are hurting. We ought to give the gift of forgiveness to those who have hurt us. Giving these kind of gifts will result in a joyous and meaningful Christmas. God told shepherds and keenmakers the Messiah had arrived. And I'm telling you, the Messiah has come. And I'm glad he came. Are you? Let me wrap this up. What are you really going to give for Christmas this year? Have you thought about yourself? You don't even need to wrap yourself up. Just give yourself away. First of all, give your heart to the Savior. And once you've done that, it'll be much easier for you to give your attention to your family. Give your compassion. Give your forgiveness to those who are alienated. I promise you, when you look for the right person in the right places and you give the right gift, your level of joy will explode. Just this morning, at about 4.35, while standing under a really hot shower. Now, don't y'all go visual on me, all right? <laughs> I'll lose you for the conclusion, all right? Just... See, I do some of my best thinking in a shower. I was thinking about today's message and whew, God inspired me with a thought. The thought went like this. I sent my son into the world not to invade it or to intrude upon it, but I sent my son into the world to invite and to indwell. You see, if God wanted to invade the earth, he would have sent Jesus as a, a general with an army of angels to conquer us. 
If God wanted to intrude, he would have disturbed more than shepherds and wise men. Trust me, everybody would have known. But I love, I love the dichotomy of who he did annoy that first Christmas night. From shepherds in that culture, the lowliest of the low, to wise men, the brightest, most influential, and wealthiest there was. You see, they both were needy. They were both needy. And both came together to accept Jesus. But God didn't come to invade or intrude. God delivered an invitation by an angel to a group of shepherds. And he said, go and see. God delivered an invitation to some wise men to follow a star and find a savior. And Jesus, during his three years of public ministry, invited disciples to follow him and seekers to come and dine with him and those with questions to come and challenge him. He didn't turn anyone away. He invited all to come and share life with him. What's the purpose of the invitation? That Jesus might fulfill his nickname, Emmanuel. God with us. Paul said, Christ in us now, our hope of glory. For unto us a child is born, so that into us a Savior will be born. There was a missionary team that had been invited to Russia to teach about Christianity. It was Christmas time. And as they taught the story of Christ's birth at an orphanage, everybody listened in amazement. Can you imagine this? None of the kids had ever heard the story. None of the teaching staff had ever heard the story. Can you imagine being 10 years old and never having heard the Christmas story? Can you imagine being 30 years old and never ever hearing the Christmas story? One of the missionaries wrote, we gave the children some materials, some construction paper and crayons, and we instructed them to create the manger scene that they had just been told. All went very well until they got to one table where little Misha, about a six-year-old boy, he had finished his project. The missionary said, as I looked at the little boy's manger, I, I, I was startled to see not one, but two babies in the manger. I called for a translator to ask the little boy why. Looking at his completed manger scene, the child began to repeat the Christmas story very, very accurately, almost word for word, until he came to the part where Mary put the baby Jesus in the manger. It was at that point in the story that Misha started to ad-lib his own ending. He said, and when Mary laid the baby in the manger, baby Jesus looked at me and asked me, do you have a place to stay tonight? I told him, I have no mama, I have no papa, I have no place to stay. And then baby Jesus told me, I could stay with him. So I got into the manger, and then Jesus looked at me, and he told me I could stay with him forever. Putting his hand over his face, Misha's head dropped to the table, and his shoulders shook as he sobbed and he wept. He had found someone who would never abandon him, someone who would never abuse him, someone who said, you can stay with me forever. You need to understand that manger, it's a keen-sized bed. It's a keen who slept in it, but it is so big, there's room for you in it too. That's our only message this Christmas, is there's room at the cross for you. I don't know what star or instrument God used to lead you here today, but I do not believe it was an accident for any one of you. I believe it's a divine appointment for some of you. Five years ago, the Saturday preceding Christmas Sunday, I had the privilege of preaching a Christmas service in Chowchilla Prison. I feared that day that some of those inmates would think that they were too bad and too unworthy to be forgiven. Today in this service, I fear that some of you will think that you are too good to seek forgiveness. Five years ago, I was proven wrong as several women gave their hearts to the babe of Bethlehem. I hope some of you will prove me wrong today. 
Do you remember the opening line of this message? People on a plane and people in a pew have a lot in common. All are on a journey. Most are satisfied with predictable experiences. It's a nice flight. It's a sweet worship service. And we often exit the same way we entered. And we're happy to return some other time. But a few are not content with nice and sweet. They want more. The little boy asked as he entered the plane, will they let me meet the pilot? Would you like to meet the pilot? His name is Jesus. He's the babe of Bethlehem. He's the sacrifice at Calvary. He's the risen Savior who left behind an empty tomb so that your heart will not be empty anymore. No fancy formula, no specially designed worded prayer. An honest confession of your soul that says, God, I want you and I need you and I don't want to be satisfied with less than all that you are because it's exactly what I need. Let's pray. And why don't you in the quietness of this moment, in the privacy of your own heart, invite the babe who was born in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago to be birthed in your heart today. Dear Father, thank you for this season. Thank you for the occasion that we have to pause, to reflect, to maybe recharge, to reignite. But for some, Father, it will be a time to discover, just as the Magi and the shepherds did, the Jesus who the scriptures told about and they have found today that he's everything the prophecy said he would be. And they're ready to invite him in. Thank you, Father, that while you're listening to my prayer for them, you are now listening to their prayer for themselves. You're hearing that heart that says, God, I've ignored you. God, I've denied you. God, I've wanted nothing to do with you. God, I've been mad at you. But God, today, I need you. I don't know all the exact words I have to say, but you died for my sins. You rose again to come live in me. I invite you to be my Emmanuel. I don't ever want to be abandoned again. I don't ever want to be abused again. I want someone to love me with unconditional love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our prayers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas. Hope to see many of you Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock. Special service right here in the sanctuary.